Hi, I'm Dan Lagani with Silver Solutions, the senior focused home services company. And welcome to this edition of AgeWise. The goal with the show every episode is to help make you a little smarter and better informed about something that you or a loved one may deal with as you grow older. And today we dig into the interesting topic, and that is the growth of telemedicine platforms, especially post-COVID. We sat down recently with the chief clinical officer of one of the more interesting telemedicine platforms out there called NOCD, and we had a conversation with Dr. Patrick McGrath. His platform helps deal with, across all 50 states, a range of obsessive compulsive disorders. We covered many of them including a conversation about hoarding, where it's connected to OCD and how it differs. We also came to better understand why the World Health Organization classifies OCD as one of the 10 most debilitating afflictions someone can have. And most importantly, we talked about what effective treatment can actually look like. So if you or a family member are suffering from some form of OCD, then watch today's conversation. And we know that through this discussion, we're going to make your process a little bit better. Dr. Patrick McGrath, thanks so much for joining us today on AgeWise. Well, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So, Dr. McGrath, I I talked in the intro about NoCD as an online behavioral health platform. But talk a little more specifically, what is NoCD and what areas do you focus on? NoCD is a... As you said, online platform, we do teletherapy with people and we focus on obsessive compulsive disorder, but we also focus on body focused repetitive behaviors such as hair pulling or trichotillomania, skin picking, which is called excoriation, ticks, and we work with people who have hoarding problems as well too. You know, it's interesting you mentioned hoarding. I know that hoarding is considered a compulsive disorder. How does it differ than OCD? So perhaps you start with What's the clinical definition of OCD? Sure. So obsessive compulsive disorder would be the experience of intrusive thoughts or images or urges that we find to be disturbing or we we think they're inappropriate and they cause a lot of anxiety or distress or shame or guilt or something of that nature. So we do whatever we can to try to neutralize them. We uh, do a compulsion, which could be a behavioral or mental act that you do to hopefully make whatever the obsession is go away. That works usually for maybe a few seconds to a few minutes, and then that obsession comes back again. So then you have to start the process all over again. Now, in the history of all of this, hoarding was considered originally as part of obsessive compulsive disorder. There was this idea that maybe people were compulsively gathering things together. But what we've really found and why now hoarding is its own diagnosis is that People with hoarding actually have a problem of discarding things. They have trouble getting rid of stuff, right? So when I'm now working with someone who has a hoarding issue, I'm going to take a look at their home and what's going on. And is there paths? Are they able to get through it? Are there rooms they can't even use? And we'll see why is it that they've in the past saved so many of the things that they've collected over time. I want to come back to hoarding in a second because it is very close and dear to what we work with at Silver Solutions. Hmm. But let's talk for a second more broadly about some of the other subtypes of OCD because there's a bunch of them, isn't there? Yeah. So everyone's probably pretty familiar with things you'd see on TV. You know, the washing your hands because you're afraid of a germ. You will have the people who go and check the locks in the stove to make sure that everything's off or locked and everything's okay. You may even know about people who are very perfectionistic, but there's parts of OCD that people aren't familiar with. There's harm OCD. Maybe that wasn't a bump. Maybe I ran someone over with my car and maybe I should drive back around the block again to see if I actually hit someone. There is perinatal OCD. So what if after having a baby, I'm afraid now, what if I drop the baby or what if I were to harm my child? You will have people who have relationship OCD. They may look at others and think, well, they seem to hold hands more than we do or maybe they like each other better than we do. And if if that's the case, Is there something wrong with my relationship? And then constantly questioning and questioning it over time. I have to imagine that many of us do those things, but it may not meet the clinical definition of OCD. So where does it go from being just a normal human behavior that we all exhibit 
to something that really fits that definition of a compulsion? What's the difference? Yeah, we all have quirks, right? There's there's little quirky things every one of us does. Uh, there's some people who always wait for the garage door to go all the way down and then stare at it for a minute before they leave the house. And some people might, oh, you're so OCD. Well, no, you're really not in that instance. If it's not interfering with your life, if it's not taking up more than an hour of your day, we really wouldn't be diagnosing it as obsessive compulsive disorder. We would say, yeah, that's a quirky thing that you do. Silver Solution, we work primarily with older adults. And Mm -hmm. when we were discussing some of the early elements of hoarding disorder earlier, we know that that's a progressive uh, compulsion. It seems to get worse and intensify over time with other trigger events. Uh, Is that the case with most subtypes of OCD or do they affect all ages, all genders, all socioeconomic brackets? So OCD can strike at any time. Um, It is more common in younger people that's where you would see the genesis of it but it's not unheard of that even someone who's more advanced in age could also develop obsessive compulsive disorder but i like how you pointed out dan something that i think is important the one thing that's different about hoarding than you see in almost any other mental health disorder ocd or not is that it does appear to get worse over time because more and more things are collected so more and more things come in the home and the house gets more and more stuff in it right Uh, In general, for almost everything else, you see that as people age, things seem to get a little bit better, right? Just age somehow kind of regulates things, but not in hoarding. And here's something that also surprises a lot of people. Hoarding typically starts in adolescence, but because there's the influence of parents who are (laughs) clean your room and do all this stuff, there may be kind of stop gaps along the way that really help to prevent it from really being noticed. But then people go out on their own and that's when the hoarding really starts when they're more on their own. And unfortunately then by the time they get older, they've just had so much time to be able to collect so many things that that's when it really starts to become a problem in people's homes. You talked about the appropriate behavioral therapy or uh, retraining a little bit earlier, and I think you referred to it as an ERP. Yes, exposure Talk and a response little bit prevention. more about that and the respo- exposure and response prevention. Is that applicable across most compulsive disorders? Absolutely. And in fact, across most anxiety-based disorders, you will have variants of exposure and response prevention therapy. Say if you had panic, I would expose you to internal sensations of panic. I might have you run in place and hyperventilate and breathe through a straw and spin in a chair to teach you how to handle those bodily sensations. If you had social anxiety, I'd want you to practice interacting with people and eventually doing a speech and even putting a mistake in it on purpose and and giving that speech to a group of people. So uh, you, you always are trying to purposely expose people to uncomfortable situations, which is great. But just remember, Dan, that happens to everybody every day. We're exposed to things that are uncomfortable. How you respond to it is what's most important. Do you do the immediately gratifying safety behavior? Like, do you avoid? Do you seek reassurance? Do you distract? Do you use substances? Do you do a compulsion? Or do you do response prevention? Do you do whatever you can to eliminate any of those five things and allow yourself to be in a situation that's uncomfortable and let that discomfort fade over time and allow yourself to learn, wow, I can handle that actually. I I don't need to do those immediately gratifying things. I can actually handle this situation. And once I learn that, then I'm going to be able to function better in my day-to-day life. Let's shift topics and talk about the on-staff therapists at NoCD. Um, You're available in all 50 states in the U.S., plus some of the other international regions that you referenced. Are they licensed? How do you qualify or make someone that's calling or looking for help more comfortable that the feedback that they're going to get, that the training and uh, ERP therapy that they're going to be provided is being administered by somebody that's qualified to do it? They are all licensed. And every therapist who joins NoCD goes through a very rigorous onboarding training about obsessive compulsive disorder. And then after that, uh, they go through continued trainings about our subtypes as well, too. So there's a training for tics and BFRBs. There's a training for hoarding. There's a special training for child and adolescents as well, too. And we have you know, quizzes and continuing education experiences. And we also have weekly ongoing case consultations available to all of our therapists too, 
to be able to attend for all of those areas so that they can bring up any case that might be on their caseload to one of us in the clinical leadership who can then help walk them through any troubles shooting areas that may need to be attended to. I want to touch on just one last thing sure. about the platform of telehealth. Is it telephone only? Is there a video option? And in many respects, did COVID help make that even easier for people to accept as a form of treatment? Yeah. Uh, we do all Zoom uh, work, so it's all video and audio based, and and the video is important. You want that interaction, you know, and and studies have shown that it's you get just as good results, maybe even better results on teletherapy for a lot of people, especially again with the fact that I can be in people's homes now instead of them having to come to my office. So the connection is wonderful with that, and we were teletherapy uh, before COVID hit, so it gave us a leg up actually that we were already doing the teletherapy work, but COVID definitely helped with the acceptance of teletherapy as being a viable option. And I'm so thrilled now that even with uh, changes and what's going on and how COVID seems to be kind of falling by the wayside a bit, we hope anyway, yeah, that teletherapy is still going to remain and be a viable option going forward for people to be able to use. And Patrick, at some point, the question always comes up about cost. What does the therapy cost and does insurance cover it? Insurance covers a vast majority of the work that we do. So um, that will depend. It could be a full coverage. There could be a copay and there could be people who it's more cash pay. And um, some, we run promotions at times in various states for therapists and and we do, as I said, have a payment plan available as well for people too. So we can work with people on the cost to make sure that it's not a burden to them. One of the things, Stephen, when we started this was we wanted to make sure that we had a type of therapy that was affordable. Uh, often, if if you're going in, even in some major cities, you might pay three or $400 out of pocket to see an OCD specialist in, in some of the larger markets. We want to make sure that we have a more affordable experience for people so that anybody who has OCD would be able to get the help that they need. Yeah, it's fascinating. Even at Silver Solutions, where we used to do all of our home assessments in person, the vast majority are done via video. And not only is it more efficient, it feels less invasive for the families. Um, and I, like you, believe that that is a permanent change that we're all going to continue to see post-COVID. Yeah. You had some big news uh, a couple of weeks back on a new celebrity spokesperson. Talk mm -hmm. about who that is and yeah. what the connection is to NoCD. Working with Howie Mandel to really get the message out about no OCD, as in K-N-O-W OCD, uh, kind of a play on our NoCD name, right? Uh, and I thought it was a great idea of getting a comedian to talk about OCD not being a joke, right? So here's someone who's made a living about jokes, but who also has OCD, who will tell you that it's the most difficult thing that he has to deal with on his day-to-day -day life is having OCD and how it's not a funny thing and it's not something, again, that anybody wants or you just have a little bit of or something like that, that it's a very significant problem. So we're, we're really happy to have that partnership with Howie Mandel. Before we go, talk a little bit about your own journey. You're a clinical psychologist and you're the chief clinical officer of NoCD. How did you get into psychology to start and, and, and what was the path to your current role? Um, when I was 16, 15, 16 is when call waiting came out and my father forced call waiting upon the family because I was doing therapy sessions with people. I was like Lucy with the psychiatric uh, five cents, please kind of thing going on. Uh, I, I seem to have helped someone once talking to them. And then my phone number started getting passed out to other people who would randomly call me and say, you don't know me, but you talked to so-and-so once. And they said you were helpful. Can I talk to you? And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I just started doing, you know, grassroots therapy at 16 years old with people in the neighborhoods, some of whom I've still never met in person. I, I would know their voice maybe, but that's it. Um, and, and so I thought, well, uh, maybe, maybe this is what I do for a living. So I, I uh, went to graduate school and then was fortunate enough to get a postdoctoral fellowship at the St. Louis Behavioral Medicine Institute and work with Alec Pollard, who was 
one of the pioneer treaters in intensive treatment for anxiety disorders and OCD. And, and I worked under him for a couple of years and then went out and started opening up my own programs. So I've opened up a few intensive outpatients, some partial hospital, and even a residential treatment center for anxiety and OCD. And, uh, then when this opportunity for no CD came along, it was, it was a great fit to be able to, um, take things that are going on personally and professionally and combine them all into one. So I get to work from home now and I have the broadest reach of working with people who have anxiety and OCD that I've ever had in my life. And it's very fulfilling. Dr. Patrick McGrath, the clinical director of no CD. Thanks so much for joining us today and for being our guest on AgeWise and for helping to make us all a little bit smarter about a really important topic and an exciting new platform for treating compulsive disorders. I'm Dan Lagani. If you like today's episode of AgeWise, please share it with a friend. And if you want to subscribe, you can visit all of our back sessions by going to silversolutions.com and clicking the video tab, or by going to Apple Podcasts and pressing the subscribe button for AgeWise. Thanks again for joining us and for all of us here at Silver Solutions who work hard every day to make your life better. Be safe and stay wise.